Hello, welcome back to Bonaventure Time. So I've made a couple of videos more instructional on what is philosophy, what is its nature, what is its study. Um, I just finished making chapters for those videos, so it's easier to just watch certain parts like metaphysics or logic. So I hope that makes it easier if you're not interested in watching it. I know the last video was very long, so I'm hoping that can help you if you're just looking for like 11 minutes on metaphysics or something like that. Uh, today, I want to get back to just talking about philosophical texts and philosophical ideas. We're going to discuss Hildebrand today. Uh, I'm I'm going to try to make this under 10 minutes, so this is just a quick introduction. If you want more on this, uh, just comment below and I'll make more. Um, let's get into it. So you want to study Hildebrand. You've maybe watched my introduction to value philosophy, or maybe you're familiar with value philosophy. But there's something that really distinguishes Dietrich von Hildebrand from, say, a lot of his contemporaries and even the preceding philosophers in the Catholic world. What is this? This is The Heart by Dietrich von Hildebrand, and this he's actually wrote a book. There's many different ones he's written. Uh, there's The Heart, there's The Nature of Love. You're going to get a lot of these ideas and a lot of his texts, even in his main ethics uh, and art of living. Um, it's just, it's going to show up. So what is the big deal with Hildebrand and The Heart, and why is this something to be noted in philosophy? Well, as Hildebrand notes in the beginning of this text, that The Heart has been really set aside in philosophy. Uh, if you take into account Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, the the feelings and emotions are just deemed irrational. If you're Thomas Aquinas and even Augustine, uh, you deem them as passions, right, under the category in Secunda Secunda, right? And the City of God makes a little bit more of a recognition of the role of emotions, uh, and you see this especially in the Confessions of St. Augustine. But nonetheless, it still is under the category of passions, right? Even Bonaventure makes this distinction, or uh, makes a distinction for sure, but still category, categorizes it under passions. And Hildebrand finds this an uh, injustice towards the heart, and throughout this text, uh, he wants to make a distinction between lower affectivity and higher affectivity. So Hildebrand really makes three categories. There's more, but these are the three important ones to introduce you to, to Hildebrand's thought in the heart. And he talks about bodily feelings, psychic feelings, and spiritual feelings. The bodily and psychic are lower affectivity, and the higher affectivity would be spiritual feelings. And he distinguishes these from each other. Well, first, let's just go through each of them. Bodily feelings. This is like pain, something that you right that you experience directly towards your body right and this could be or actually i think hildebrand himself uses the uh, example of euphoria uh when you drink wine right and, and you don't necessarily know the cause of this pain but it's something experienced directly in relation to your body something like pain right non-intentional uh and that's a very uh, it's a phenomenological word and that's very important um right non-intentional you don't know the cause and, and, and it's uh, it's uh, got a relation to the body right and, it, and it's causal right and if we go to psychic feelings while these might seem a little similar they're actually a little different because psychic feelings could be something like fear right but this you could know the object of your psychic feeling but you may not know need to know it right it has no effect whether you know it right say something crashes behind you i think this is the example hildebrand uses in ethics Say something crashes behind you, you may, or, or a loud noise, you may startle, you may have a sense of fear, but you may not know exactly what that fear is directed towards, and that has no impact on your feeling, right? It doesn't matter if you knew what crashed behind you or not. You have this feeling of fear, and it only at, or lasts, excuse me, in what Hildebrand calls an actual existence. If you want more on this, read Chapter 2 of The Nature of Love by Dietrich von Hildebrand. It gives a great synthesis or um analysis on actual and super actual existence but this has an actual existence right and similar to bodily feelings right it's caused right it does have certain relations to the body not at all times but it does and it's certainly ex experienceable right it's um got a sentient sort of causality to it you could almost say if you're uh familiar with edith stein and and right it's not intentional still right it, it, you're not in the case of the fear, right, you're not really intentional about, right, you may be fearful about something, but you're, you're not intentional or fully consciousness of what you're fearful of, right? And so these are psychic feelings and bodily feelings, right? And they only last insofar as the object of the feeling that it's responding to or that the feeling itself is responding to lasts, right? So my fear of whatever crashed behind me only lasts insofar as right the object of my fear is there right namely something that crashed and it startles me i have fear 
But then as soon as I'm out of that experience, it's gone. There's no continuation of that, right? Same with the euphoria. As soon as that wears off, right, that existence of the euphoria is gone. Now, I may, and you could object and say, I may experience euphoria again or I may experience fear again, right? But that's not a continuation of the original feeling, right? And this is the big distinguishment. Now we move to spiritual feelings. What's different about these? Well, what's different is they're intentional, right? And, and, and Hildebrand speaks of veneration, admiration, love. These are the higher affectivity, right? <clears throat> and these are intentional, right? You are consciously aware of who you're directing your love towards, right? And while the psychic and the bodily feelings were caused by something, right? Namely the euphoria or the object that crashed, these are not caused, Hildebrand says. These are motivated and motivated by a value, right, that is impresses itself upon us, right? This is this being affected that you would find in chapter 17 of Hildebrand's Ethics. And this being affected, right, means that these higher feelings, these higher affectivity, or this higher affectivity is a gift. And he talks about this in, in chapter 7 and 8 of The Heart. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful chapter, or really it's a wonderful book, but those two chapters are so wonderful. And this idea that, that love, right, is a gift that impresses itself. It's not something that we cause. It, it's something we respond to, right? And there's that value response. If you're not familiar with that, I made a video on introduction to value philosophy. I would go check that out if this doesn't make sense. So there's a big distinguishment there. And, and I think Hildebrand really has something there, right? These higher spiritual feelings do have this characteristic of a gift, right? And they're intentional. They're not caused. They're motivated by value. Right. And they have what Hildebrand would call a super actual existence. Right. If I love. Right. Even though I'm not consciously actualizing that love in a moment, maybe I'm doing school, maybe I'm watching a movie, maybe I'm taking a walk through a park and I'm thinking about something. Right. The love is enduring, though. And Edith Stein even knits this in her philosophy of psychology. Right. This love endures. It, it's not like fear where it just reactualizes again. It's something that when you reactualize it, it's the same feeling that's in super actual existence, right? It continues to endure, right? Now, something like respect versus veneration, Hildebrand would say, are still super actual existence, but they're a little different. And, and if you want more on that, I would read, I believe it's chapter four of the heart. And that kind of gives more of an account, or, or excuse me, it's chapter two, the nature of love. Um, that's where he talks about that. But, right, this veneration, right, and this love and adoration for the Lord, right? I may not be consciously thinking about adoring the Lord at the moment, but, right, that love that I love the Lord by is still existing, right? It's still continuing, even if I'm not actualizing in the present moment, right? So I hope you can see that there is a massive difference that Hildebrand has found between spiritual feelings and psychic and bodily feelings, right? And I think he's justified in saying that there is different spheres to affectivity, right? And it's not just him who's saying this, all right? Uh, Husserl himself made distinct distinctions like this, uh, um... Edvid Conrad Martius, uh, Shaler, Edith Stein, right? And this is, right, this idea of trying to eliminate reductionism, right? And just categorizing all the, the feelings into one category, right? And just saying, oh, they're under passions or, oh, they're irrational, right? And Hildebrand talks about that and he says, well, right, we can't judge feelings just based off of their distortions, right? We couldn't just judge the intellect based off its distortions, right? We don't do that with the will, right? And the will can lead us to do terrible things. The intellect can as well, right? So he's saying, and what he's trying to show is that we can't judge the heart based off of lower affectivity. We have to make the distinguishment and show the beauty of spiritual feelings and re-instill the dignity of the heart. Now, I want to end with this. Why should we say that these higher feelings are coming from the heart and not the will? This is a, a big, um, uh, critique a Thomist or an Aristotelian could make, right? And, and 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 I should firstly say this is not like a Thomism versus Hildebrand sort of thing. I think this is something that Hildebrand is actually in continuity with Aquinas because Aquinas makes some really interesting footnotes in his Summa and, and in his commentaries, and I think actually he would agree with this. Um, he just, um, I think, Hildebrand was focused more on finding the heart and Aquinas was focused on many other things, right? Because he wrote a lot. So I want to stress that. But, right, this is a certain, certainly justified objection. Why do we say it's from the heart and not the will? Well, Hildebrand notes this, and I believe this would you'd find this in chapter 17 
in the ethics, um, but it's certainly in the heart as well, right? The will we have command of, right? We certainly have this command over the will where I can will to will. I can will to get myself out of bed, right? But with the heart, I don't have that sort of freedom, right? I can't just will myself to feel this way towards another. I can't just will myself to cry sorrowful tears, as Hildebrand notes, right? I don't have that level of freedom as I do with the will, right? And and this is, again, this idea of being affected and responding, right? What I do have is this ability to move my heart to 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 prepare the will right to uh purify my heart so i can be affected by values and then i can be then i can respond to value right and 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 the heart though i don't have total freedom over it which is something Immanuel kant was so afraid of right and that's why he eliminated it out of ethics Hildebrand's saying this has a massive importance in ethics because the heart is when we make a value our own right when we totally uh, really conform to the value. We identify with the value, right? So while I can't command my heart in the same way, I can prepare it with the will to be affected by value. And then I can, what Hildebrand calls cooperative freedom, work with and respond to the value, sanction a yes, like a fiat, right? Saying a yes to responding to this value. And I can identify with the value and pour my heart into it. Right. And I, I think Hildebrand has a great case there. Right. Because I, I think if you think about this in context, right, I can will the good. I can will to love someone. Right. But I and Hildebrand makes this example. The beloved is not my own until the hearts are exchanged. Right. And and, and he talks about this because Hildebrand had a fascination and a deep admiration and love for the sacred heart of Jesus. Right. D- he had a deep devotion to there. And he was wondering why it wasn't the sacred intellect, the sacred will. You know, it's the sacred heart of Jesus. And he says it's because Jesus wants our hearts and he calls that and that's the unity between the beloved right and 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 the lover right and and so Hildebrand is really trying to show the true dignity of the heart and its role not only in anthropology but in ethics right because if we commit our heart to something right we are lifted to a higher moral status right because we've given ourselves completely to this moral good to this moral value and we identify with it right and so I think Hildebrand has a great case here. I'd love to hear back from you guys uh, what you think about this. Does the heart, is it over-exaggerated by Hildebrand, or what do you think about it? So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope it's a great introduction to the heart by Dietrich von Hildebrand. Please like it, this video, and please subscribe, and I hope to see you next time. God bless.